In this video, I will introduce the so-called sigma notation for sums. This is a convenient notation to write complicated sums in a nice compact way. I will begin with an easy example to explain the notation. Let's look at the sum 1 third plus 1 quarter plus 1 fifth plus 1 sixth plus 1 seventh. This is a sum. To write sums in a compact way, we use the Greek letter uppercase sigma. I look at the terms I am adding, and they are all 1 over something. All the terms I am adding have the form 1 over i, where i takes some integer values. I indicate this by writing an i under the sigma, to mean that i is what changes from term to term. Among all the terms, the smallest value of i, the first one, is 3. I indicate this by writing i equals 3 under the sigma. That is the first term. And then, for all the other terms, i keeps increasing by 1 each time, until the last value, which is 7. I indicate this by writing 7 on top of the sigma. i equals 7 is the last value. And that's it. That is how I write a sum in a compact way. This nice compact expression in the red box, we call it the sum of 1 over i from i equals 3 to 7. More generally, we can write the sum of a sub i from i equals 1 to n, which we could write with symbols like this, to represent the sum a1 plus a2 plus a3 and so on, all the way to a n. In general, a sub i could represent anything that depends on an integer i. Of course, this notation is particularly useful when a sub i is a complicated expression. Notice that we do not have to use i necessarily as the index. We could use other summation indices. For example, what could be the sum of a sub k from k equals 1 to n? It could be the sum a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 and so on all the way to a sub n. In other words, it could be exactly the same sum. And this brings us to an important point. The summation index is a dummy index. This means that it does not carry any intrinsic meaning. i doesn't mean anything special. We could use k instead of i, or any other letter, or any other symbol, as long as we are not currently using that other symbol for something else, of course. If that is clear, here is a little exercise to test that you understand the notation. I have written three different sums with sigma notation. They all have a different value. Pause the video, try to compute the three sums, and when you are ready, Keep watching. Let's do this. In the first sum, the summation index is i. i is what changes from term to term. For the purpose of the sum, k is just a constant. So the sum is 1 over k plus 2 over k plus 3 over k, or simply 6 over k. By contrast, in the second sum, the summation index is k. k is what changes from term to term. For the purpose of the sum, i is just a constant, so the sum is i over 1 plus i over 2 plus i over 3, which comes out to be 11 times i over 6. What about the third sum? The summation index is mu. For the purpose of the sum, both i and k are constant. So the thing I am adding, i over k, does not change from term to term. I am just adding it three times. i over k plus i over k plus i over k, which is three times i over k. To conclude the video, I will mention two important properties. These are not new results. These are properties you learned back in grade 1 or 2, except you did not have the sigma notation for sums back then. First, what happens when I have a sum and there is a constant c multiplying every term? I can simply take the constant c out of the sum. This is just a fancy way to say, take common factor, or use the distributive property, that's all. And second, what if I have a sum of terms of the form a sub i plus b sub i? I can add all the a terms first, and then add all the b terms. This is due to the commutative and associative properties of addition. I can regroup and reorder how I add terms. That's all. Notice that these are not new formulas to be memorized. These are just all results written in terms of the new notation. 